Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Our subject this evening, one man, John the Baptist. And remember what Yeshua said concerning him when he spoke of John and he said, of those born of women, meaning in a natural way, no one has risen greater than John the Baptist. So one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is this, what made John so great? What was it that Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth saw in him that caused him to say those words? Take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 14. Now, normally when people talk about John the Baptist, we can think about the fact that he ate some peculiar food. Likewise, he dressed in a unique way. And not only that, even though the scripture says he was a priest, he was not serving in Jerusalem. Why was that? Because of the corruption which dominated that city and the leadership, both the Romans and the Sanhedrin, the Jewish government. And where was John most of the time? He was in the desert, the wilderness by the Jordan River. And what is he first and foremost known for? Well, every time almost that he's mentioned in the scripture, we speak about John the Baptist. And when you hear that term, baptism, what comes into your mind? The right response should be repentance. John called the people to repentance. And unfortunately today, repentance isn't spoke about as it should be. It is ignored many places. In fact, I wonder if John were to be alive now in our generation. I wonder if he could get a job as a preacher in some prestigious church. No, my concern is this, that I think John would be rejected because of the power of his words, because of the commitment that he demanded, because of his primary message, and that was repentance. Realize something. There is scripturally a relationship between repentance and obedience. When one repents, they repent from disobedience. Disobedience that manifests itself in sin. And when someone bears fruit worthy of repentance, they're going to be doing the will of God. They're going to be walking in obedience to the purposes of God. So this baptism of repentance was a call to obedience. Remember something. When Messiah himself was immersed by John, remember what happened? There was a voice when Messiah came up from the water having been baptized. We know something. That voice that shouted, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Why? Well, Yeshua's baptism had a purpose. It was to demonstrate to his heavenly father his obedience, that he was going to go to Jerusalem, that he was going to do the work that his father sent him into the world to do, and that was to die upon that cross, that he would be buried, but on the third day he would rise again. And remember what Paul spoke of, how we in Romans chapter 6, Paul says that we were, were buried with Messiah in the likeness of death. And likewise, we will be united with him 
in resurrection. And all of that signifies one thing, that we, just like Messiah, obeyed his Father's will. True repentance, understanding the work of Messiah, it produces in our life obedience. Now, we're not saved by our obedience. We're saved by grace based upon the work of Messiah, what he did upon that cross, his shedding of his blood. But having received that grace by faith, make no mistake about it, we are called to bear fruit worthy of repentance. And what does that mean? It means obeying God's will, doing his will. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew and chapter 14. The book of Matthew, chapter 14. And notice how this first verse begins. We read, in that time, and whenever we hear an expression like that, in that time, the reader should ask himself, what time are we referring to? What is the context? What has just happened? And you'll remember that Yeshua, he was in his own city in Nazareth. And there it says something. At the end of chapter 13, because of unbelief. And remember what I said at the conclusion last week. That phrase, unbelief, means literally against faith. It doesn't mean that they didn't understand what faith was. It means that they were opposed to faith. And because of that, he did not do many miracles. They didn't witness the power of Yeshua. And when we speak about faithlessness, when we speak about unbelieving, you know who should come into our mind? Well, look again at our text, Matthew 14, verse 1. Here is a, a poster boy for unbelief and being against faith. And whom I'm speaking about? Well, it says, in that time, Herod the Tetrarch. Now, this is a leader. He was a leader over four, over one of four areas of Israel. He had great influence. He was an important man. And notice what it says about him. Herod the Tetrarch, he heard the report of Yeshua. He heard about what Jesus was doing. The mighty deeds, the miracles, the powerful teaching, how he was impacting individuals for the kingdom of God. And notice the conclusion that Herod, and again, we're not speaking about Herod the Great. He's already long gone. We're speaking about one called Herod the Tetrarch, And it says here in our text, look now to verse 2, and he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. Now understand something. He says when he hears about one doing great things, kingdom things, speaking about the kingdom, about turning to God because, realize something, Yeshua's message was the same message of John the Baptist. When John stood at the Jordan River, what did he say? He said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when Yeshua began to preach, what was his first message? Look sometime. We studied it several months ago from Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17 when Yeshua said the same words. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John and Yeshua, they had the same message, repentance. But again, we don't hear too much about repentance today. We don't hear too many messages that produces conviction, that points out sin. That's not popular. That's not what's pleasing to people. That's not going to fill a stadium. That's not going to sell many books. That's true, it won't. But it'll be pleasing to God because God calls people to repentance. And if you're not living a repentant life, that is, if you're not turning away from sin, and embracing the word of God, 
you're not going to be pleasing to God. You're not going to be in His will. You're not going to be someone who's hearing the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So Herod, he heard about the word and the deed of Yeshua. And what did he say? He said unto his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been risen from the dead. Now, very important, from the dead, resurrection. And whenever we see in the scripture a reference to resurrection, what should come into our mind? The answer is the kingdom. There is an inherent relationship in the scripture between resurrection and the kingdom of God. So when he heard about one speaking, teaching concerning the kingdom and doing kingdom deeds, bringing kingdom order into people's life, works of restoration, he knew that John had spoken of the kingdom and he incorrectly assumed that this Yeshua, that this has John the Baptist having been raised from the dead. And look at this next phrase, and on account of this. Now, the question we should ask ourselves, because by the way, that expression, on account of this, it is emphatic in the original language. That means that the author was inspired to emphasize that statement, that phrase, on account of this. What was this? John took a stand, and we'll see this in no uncertain terms. It's not an issue of interpretation. It's not what I think and other people think differently. The text emphatically states this. What is this that, that Herod believed brought about this, this powerful deeds of this one, Yeshua, who he mistakenly thought it was John the Baptist having been raised from the dead. Well, we'll tell you what that is. But notice what the outcome was. Look at the end of verse 2. We have the word power, but it's in the plural. And it speaks of power to do great things, miraculous power to do great deeds. And he says, it's through this power that that. These great deeds are done in him, meaning in what he thinks is John the Baptist, but literally it is Yeshua. Why did he think this? Now look at verse 3. For Herod had seized John. Why? And this seizing means he had arrested him. And we know the rest of the story, but keep reading. For Herod had seized John and bound him, and placed him in prison. Why? On account of a woman, Herodias. Now, Herodias, she had been married previously to Philip, and Philip was Herod the Tatriarch's brother. And here's the key. According to the law of God, according to the commandments of God, in other words, according to the Torah. It is not permissible. That is, it is forbidden for this Herod. Even though he was a powerful man, it was forbidden for him to take his brother's wife as his wife now. And the Torah teaches it, and that's why, keep reading. Look at the end of, of, of verse, verse 3 where it says, after binding John and placing him in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of Philip, his brother. For he had said, who's the he? John. For John had said, this is verse 4, it is not lawful. And there's another emphatic phrase. What is that? For you. So John the Baptist he says to this powerful man, this governmental leader, under the authority of Rome, with Rome's support, John says to him, simply, it is not lawful for you to marry 
this woman, your former wife of your brother. It's not permissible according to the law of Moses. Now, pay attention. See, Herod could have said, but I love her. So what? She, I believe, is my destiny. So what? She satisfies. She completes me. No, this is not God's will. Herod could have even said, God had told me that this is the right woman to marry. No matter what Herod may have said, this is all speculation. It doesn't matter. Because there was no circumstance, no words, no event that would get John the Baptist to say that this woman would be permissible to this man. See, in a a rabbinical wedding, the first thing that the officiant, the rabbi says, and there's a blessing that goes with it, that the Rav, and not just him, but a committee, in Israel today, the local rabbinical association checks out the couple, and the first statement that is said in the marriage underneath the wedding canopy, the chuppah, is that blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, the king of the universe, for this woman is permissible to this man. If it's not permissible, nothing can go on. A wedding can't happen. And John the Baptist He's not influenced by power. He's not influenced by the authority of the government. What made him great? Why Yeshua said, of those born of women, no one is greater than John the Baptist, is because John stood for scriptural integrity. He had fidelity to the word of God. And let me tell you something. If your life doesn't reflect that same commitment to the scripture, You're not going to be living in a way that's pleasing to God. And you're not going to be experiencing the leadership, the guidance of the Holy Spirit in your life. And you're not going to have blessings from God. Now, you might have worldly prosperity, but you're not going to have the blessings of God. Look again at verse 4. For John had said to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And because of that, Herod, it says, and he desired him, meaning John the Baptist, to kill. But because of fear from the crowd, because as a prophet, him, meaning John the Baptist, they held. So the crowds of people, all the population, they looked at John, they saw his lifestyle, they heard his words, they saw how humble he was by the clothes he wore and how self-denial he practiced by the food he ate. That the populace, the crowds, held him to be a prophet. Now look at verse 6. But, and this means in contrast to everything we've seen, Herod did something. It was his birthday, and there was celebrating. And in the midst of this birthday party, what happened? Well, we see the daughter of Herodias. This is Herod's illawful wife. And she had a daughter, a daughter who was a young woman herself. And what did she do? She danced in the midst, meaning in the midst of this crowd. All who had gathered for this prestigious birthday party of of Herod, the patriarch. And she danced, and notice what it says. Keep reading, second part of verse 6. And she pleased Herod. He was pleased by this. Look now to verse 7. Wherefore, with an oath, he promised her to give whatever she asks. Now, this is vital. We see that Herod was so moved, not moved by the word of God, not moved by the commandments of God, not interested in the will of God. But when this young woman, when she danced in the midst 
of this great birthday celebration before Herod. It pleased him, this dance. And what did he do? In pride. He says to her, you know, whatever you ask, I am by oath will give to you. And notice what he says as he continues. He says very significantly, she pleased him. And he says, whatever you ask, I will give to you. In another scripture, it says, even unto half my kingdom. And what happens? Look now to verse, verse 8. But she being, and the word here means to be instructed previously. To be instructed previously by her mother. What did she say? She says, give to me upon the platter the head of John the Baptist. Now, this doesn't say John, but John the Baptist. Why is that? Remember what I said earlier. Baptism relates to repentance. And the world hates repentance because the spirit of repentance is the exact opposite. It is against the spirit of this world, the ways of this world. So it was John's repentance, his call to repent, and John's commitment to the law of God. And let me remind you that these two things go together. What two things? The spirit of repentance and the commandments of God. These two things go hand in hand. So she says, give to me the head of John the Baptist upon a platter. And the king, he was very, this thing made him very sad. But on account of the oath and on account of those who were reclining, that means those who were there at this party enjoying this celebration, he commanded. That, that it be given. Verse 10. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison. Verse, verse 11. And the head of his, meaning John the Baptist's head, his head was brought to her on a platter and given, given to this young woman. And what did she do? And she brought it to her her mother. Now, this is to say one thing. What was still very active in this family was a fact that they were angry. They had animosity because they were told what you want isn't God's will. It isn't lawful. And what did they want to do? Well, what did they do? They put John to death. And this is very prophetic because those who live a repentant life, the world is going to want to stamp out those people. And this is what we're seeing in our age. We're seeing how things are changing rapidly in this world. We are moving closer and closer if we're not already there. When the world calls that which is good, evil. And that which is evil in the eyes of God, the world embraces that. The world loves that. The world follows that. We are living in a time when repentance, commandments, the will of God, all of this is being set aside. And here's what's so tragic. Many congregations, many people that hold up this book. What's happening, there is a growing of so-called prophets today. And these prophets, they're not accurate. They are not saying what former prophets spoke of. They're not calling people to repentance. They're not calling people to a godly, chaste lifestyle. They're not speaking Conviction to others, what are they? They are tickling the ears of individual. They hear, supposedly from God, 
exactly what the people want to hear. That's not a prophet. That is what Messiah taught. That in the last days, there would be many false prophets. We need to get ready. We need to be wise in the will and the word of God. And it's only when you discern the word of God that you're going to have a perspective for understanding what is God's will. Look now to our last verse, verse 12. His disciples, whose disciples? John the Baptist. His disciples, they came. Now, this word for coming has to do with being made to come. It was because they weren't coming other than the fact that they had heard about John's murder. And that's exactly what it was. We see that King Herod, we see that his wife Herodias, we see that these individuals, they murdered a man who spoke truth. That's where the world is heading to. That's going to happen more and more in the last days. The world will not tolerate one who speaks and calls the world to repentance. So his disciples, they came and they took the body, the dead body of John the Baptist, and they buried it. And what did they do thereafter? After going They proclaimed to Yeshua. What did they proclaim? What had happened? That John, the forerunner of Yeshua, was put to death. And here's my last point. Remember what I shared with you. I shared that John, he had a message of repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Yeshua, he had that same message. And what do we learn? We learn that the Roman authority in Rome is symbolic of the world. The Roman authority, the government of the world, put John to death. And guess what? We also see that same Roman Empire also went in order to put Yeshua to death. Now, Yeshua, he laid down his life. No one took it, but we see the hatred that the world has for one who speaks repentance and one who prepares others for the kingdom of God. Get ready. The time is approaching. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Shalom from Israel.